welcomes the public library. Uh, a few preliminaries before we start. Uh, if you haven't already done so, please mute your cell phones. And uh, let you know where the bathrooms are located. When you go through the back door there, you're, you'll be there. If you come throughout these doors, turn right, go past the staircase, and turn right again down the hallway. We want to thank the Massachusetts Foundation for the Humanities for making this program possible tonight. And also to Ron Gerard from Lemister TV for filming the program. And um, on the seat as you came in, you will see a evaluation form. Uh, I ask that um, you take a few minutes after the program to um, fill it out. And when you're done, just drop the form and the pins at the back table there. And you also see there is a um, schedule of events for this entire program. The exhibit isn't here yet. It's supposed to get here tomorrow, late in the day. So, um, so next time you come, it should be up. Sorry for the inconvenience. Uh, and also to remind you, next week's program is going to be at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Okay? And uh, if you haven't also done so, in the historic building, we do have a book display um, called The Chinese and the Iron Road. If you have a time, please stop in and peruse the books. So our, our speaker tonight is Dr. Anthony Lee. His presentation is about early Chinese migrants in Massachusetts. Dr. Lee is the Idella Clinton Kendall Professor of Art History at Mount Holyoke College. He is an art historian, critic, curator, and photographer. As a critic and scholar, he writes about American photography and modernist painting in the period between 1860 and 1960. As a photographer, he documents ethnic and immigrant communities. Dr. Lee is the recipient of the Charles C. Eltridge Prize for Distinguished Scholarship in American Art given by the Smithsonian's National Museum of American Art and of the Cultural Studies Book Prize given by the Association for Asian American Studies. He is founder and editor of the acclaimed book series, Defining, Mon Defining Moments in American History. Please welcome Anthony Lee. I'm glad to have preceded the exhibit, actually, <laughs> and I encourage you to come back. I will certainly come back as well. Um, tonight, I'd, I'd like, what I'd like to do is to talk a little bit about um, photography as it relates to the exhibit, which is about the Chinese who took a very large role in the development of the Transcontinental Railroad, the 150th anniversary of which we are celebrating this year. Uh, and it's a, a talk that is really kind of localized to Massachusetts and a particular corner of Massachusetts, uh, North Adams, Massachusetts, that kind of far away place that folks don't really go to very much anymore except to go to Mass Boca. Uh, uh, what I'd like to do especially today, since my specialty is the history of art, is to think a little bit about the ways in which we can use photographs, many of which exist in our collections, many of which will be included in the exhibition, uh, to think about history and the ways in which we can use photographs to interpret history. And I'll take a particular case study to do that, involving the Chinese who came across the Chinese kind of kind of road into Massachusetts here. It's about a 40-minute talk or so, and I want to warn you, uh, a couple of times I'm going to ask for audience participation here. So I'll ask you to I'll ask some questions for you, and I kind of really want some, some you know, uh, honest and insightful answers to the things. No, no worries about interest in here. We just really want to kind of get into the photographs a little bit. So let me begin. Uh, let me introduce us to the, the three main groups of actors who make up the story this evening. They are, number one, the enterprising factory owners of Massachusetts in the 1860s, who at this particular moment in American history are making good on all the industrial promises of the great factories. Uh, their factories are humming along, their machinery is producing lots of material, they're importing many more immigrant la uh, laborers than had previously been the case to try to man the factory births. And of course, they're beginning to confront those pesky labor unions <laughs> that are somehow wanting things from the factory owners. So that's one 
major actor in the story. The second major actor in the story are, in fact, the members of the labor unions, those folks who are, in fact, manning the factory floors. Many of them are locals, but many of them have been brought to the areas because the local population simply wasn't large enough to man all those factory berths, and so the factory owner would bring more and more and more workers. And the third group of actors who make up our story today are from far away in California, Chinese immigrants who have arrived in San Francisco hoping to make fortunes for themselves here. And I'm showing you just simply two photographs that give us kind of the far ends of this spectrum here. On the right side, a typical factory town in New England in the 1870s. This sort of happens to be North Mountains, Massachusetts. We could have probably pulled up Holyoke, Massachusetts, East Hampton, Massachusetts, Lemonster, you know, Pittsburgh, Gardner. It could have been any number of these factory towns here. And over on the left, uh, the main central street in what is today San Francisco's Chinatown. Today it's called Grant Avenue. Back then it was called DuPont Street. Who are the, the members of that uh, population there? Primarily young men who have left southeastern China because of the horrific economic conditions in southeastern China. They make their way by Pacific steamship across the uh, Pacific Ocean, arrive in San Francisco hoping to find some economic um, uh, uh, development for themselves. Uh, they try their hands at the gold mines, and like for virtually everyone else who goes to the gold mines, they end up with not a whole lot. <laughs> they end up back in San Francisco looking for any kind of work that will happen, and finally they come to see that there are various kinds of opportunities waiting for them if they were only to leave the confines of San Francisco's Chinatown and venture out into the various parts of the country here. So, those are our three central actors for the story here. We wander up here and advance this for a second. Is that the photographer's name, Tate or Lord? Yes, uh, that sure is. Uh, uh, Isaiah West Tabor on the left, and uh, Henry D. Ward over on the right. Let me just make sure I do this right. Okay, here we go. Uh, let me give you more specifics about our particular actors in this large drama. One factory owner in particular began to understand the possibilities available to him with the development and the final spike driven into the Transcontinental Railroad. Not only were there laborers here in Massachusetts who he had to contend with, and sometimes who he had to fight with, there also was a massive pool of laborers on the other side of the country if you were to take advantage of that Transcontinental Railroad. His name was Calvin Sampson. He was a shoe factory owner in North Adams, not a particularly successful one, but successful enough that he was enlarging his factory and finding that the labor organizers within his factory were causing problems for him. Right? Uh, the other set of actors in North Adams are those members who make up the shoe factory's labor union. We have many of their names, but they perfect uh, preferred to be called, collectively, the Knights of St. Crispin. Okay. Uh, and the third set of specific <coughs> actors are, in fact, these characters. 72 <coughs> Chinese men who eventually make their way across the United States on the newly completed Transcontinental Railroad and arrive in North Adams, Massachusetts. We, too, also know their names. Uh, probably many of the names we know because of the census takers are inaccurate or incorrect. Uh, the census taker had never heard Chinese names before in North Adams. So kind of, in fact, if you look at the census, kind of like made up names. <laughs> they made up lots of different names. They all seem to have the same last name in this group of 72 laborers here. Uh, I wish I could show you many more specifics of them. But as they first arrived in North Adams, Massachusetts, the Calvin Sampson, the shoe factory owner, had arranged a remarkable thing to happen. He, in fact, had called a photographer well ahead of time to meet him at the railroad station as he marched his new laborers up to the factory floor, lined them up against the south wall of his factory, and had a photograph of made of them. And it's an extraordinary photograph. It is the very first photograph in this country of Chinese laborers east of the Mississippi River here. Okay. Uh, those of you who might recognize the format of the photograph here, what we're looking at are two very similar photographs mounted on a single plate mount. 
and it's called a, uh, no, it's a stereoscope. stereoscope or stereo viewer, right? It was a sort of thing that was quite popular in the middle of the 19th century among middle class Americans who would buy stereo viewers. You would buy these stereo cards and you would pop them into the viewer and look at them. They sort of looked a lot like, uh, you know, those magic lantern yeah, things that you wrote. Early, earlier photographer in London stood by the name of Eddie Davis, took a lot of those, and yeah. apparently had the limits of Star Wars. Yeah, Society. I bet you if some of your families date back to the middle of the 19th century here in New England, I'm sure they probably have stereo viewers. It's an incredibly popular thing here. And so at least we know that this first photograph of Chinese east of the Mississippi River was meant to be viewed in a stereo viewer. It was probably also meant to be thought of as a, a kind of popular photograph to go along with the kind of popular entertainment that stereo viewers were. We'll come back to this extraordinary photograph and see what we can make of it here. But let's go back to the Chinese arriving in this part of the world here. Uh, you've, I'm sure you've seen many kinds of examples, photographic, but probably more familiarly caricatures and newspapers and magazines and cartoons about the Chinese arrival. Much of that arrival and much of the development of the Transcontinental Railroad was greeted with enthusiasm, excitement, particularly on the part of factory owners. After all, what it did was it opened up the West to labor, to markets, to stores, to goods, to all kinds of things that the Transcontinental Railroad promised here. Factory laborers themselves in New England weren't so crazy about the idea, as you might imagine here. Uh, and I think we see something of that flip side of the enthusiasm of the development of the Transcontinental Railroad in a caricature like this, or in a cartoon like this, which happened in Harper's Weekly on January 22, 1870, mere months after the conclusion of the development of the Transcontinental Railroad. The last spike had been driven into the ground here. Uh, I encourage you to look closely at this. It's called Chinese Coolies Crossing the Missouri River. How, in fact, they're crossing the Missouri River is something of a mystery in the past caricature here. They seem to be crossing where there are no bridges, after all, here. There's some kind of magic railroad track that is belayed across the river here. It's such a long, wall-like, tumultuous, snaking thing that even the paddle wheels have to stop at its kind of borders there here. And the, ma the Chinese men, like Christ, seem to be walking across the river to get to the other side here. Uh, they come one by one or two by two. And it strikes me that as much as there is such enthusiasm among the part of factory owners for the arrival of this new immigrant group, an image like this betrays something of a little bit of an anxiety as well about them. How did they get here? Why are they here? And why are there so many of them coming <laughs> in, a, in an image like that? That seems to be the kind of underlying set of attitudes that make up an image like this. And if we look further and further into the visual culture associated with this moment, we will see those two sides attending the arrival of the Chinese being played out in more and more imagery, in more and more cartoons and caricatures. Over on the right, we might imagine this to be one indicative of the factory owner's attitudes. After all, what does it suggest? All these Chinese laborers have shown up in Massachusetts. They're taking their place next to the machinery, in this case, what's called a bottoming tool in the shoe factory, because it puts literally the soles onto the bottoms of the shoes here. And there is Calvin Sampson himself showing the Chinese laborers how to go about working on these factory tools here putting bottoms on the shoes here. And we might imagine an image like this is all about the factory owner's bliss of having gotten new laborers into his factory. And over on the left side, I'll suggest to you that here's the flip side once again. Isn't it all about anxiety in this sense, right? Thomas Nast, the new comet, a phenomenon now visible in all parts of the United States. And we can see a comet, like Halley's Comet, dashing across the sky. And if we look really closely at it, it's not just any old comet. It's got the face of a Chinese laborer. And behind the face of the Chinese laborer, there's a tail with words written in it. And it says, I don't know if you can see it from where you are there, it says, cheap labor. <laughs> and all the, all the people in the foreground, all they can do is take out their, for whatever reason, these gigantic telescopes they seem to have conveniently hidden in their coats, right? They've ripped out these telescopes, they're looking up at the sky at the astral phenomena, and what do they see? 
immigrant labor coming across the sky, cheap labor coming across the sky, and landing in their territory, and there's not a thing they can do about it. Right? So on one hand, enthusiasm, on the other hand, anxiety here. So, if that's the kind of general popular tenor that matches the arrival of the Chinese, for someone like me as an art historian, when we look at other kinds of visual images, perhaps not caricatures, the things that appear in Harper's Weekly, but things like photographs like this, we might want to ask ourselves, well, what kind of tone should we give to an image like this? And can we match it up with those other kinds of attitudes that begin to attend the Chinese and the visual culture associated with that arrival here? Uh, I'm going to run through a number of possibilities for you about how we might think about a photograph like this. And I want to warn you ahead of time, the first several possibilities we're going to say are probably, no, that's probably not a very good one. <laughs> that's probably not the way we want to think about this photograph here. But someone might say to us, OK, we have a bunch of laborers lined up in front of a factory in New England. Hmm. I think there are probably examples that we can imagine of pictures of laborers lined up in factories and the meanings we can ascribe to those other photographs as ways of being able to interpret this one. So, I'm sure something like this will seem utterly familiar to you, you know? They're the kind of early ID buttons that lots of factory workers wore around the factories, right? Today we have what, you know, those little kind of uh, cards that we hang around our necks or little things we kind of tuck into our pockets or we have little kind of, some kind of identifying feature. And frequently in the 1930s and the 20s and the teens, factory workers would wear these kinds of buttons with their faces and with their numbers, which suggested some kind of official identification of them. And we might look at a photograph like that over on the right and say, mm-hmm, image of a factory worker wouldn't that be a helpful way to think about images of factory workers in this case? Uh, and as I said to you, perhaps in a very large sense there might be a similarity here, but this is probably not the right way to think about the image over the left. And I can bet you, you can probably figure out from where you're sitting now why this isn't the proper way of thinking about this image. Whereas the image over on the right is one specifically about the physiognomic identification of an individual, the photograph on the left is, what, kind of a mass phenomenon in which every individual worker is hardly discerned from the other. They're simply just kind of a mass of workers here. And so when Calvin Sampson brought these workers to the front of his factory and lined them up on the back three floor and brought the photographer out, he probably didn't have this kind of photograph in mind here. He didn't think about that photograph over on the left as an identifying kind of photograph. It wasn't the kind of, you know, specific official ID that these workers were supposed to adhere to. Okay. All right. We might say, well, maybe the photograph on the left might be likened to photographs like this a little later on, right? Where, and I'm sure some of you have probably run across these before because this same photographer came to Lemonster, Mass in the early 20th century, too. His name was Lewis Hine. And he would show up at factories, and he would pull all the workers out of the factory, he would sneak into the factory, and he would take pictures of the laborers there. Um, and for him, for St. Louis Hahn, the idea of doing such a thing was to reveal the horrific conditions facing, in this case, child laborers in the factories. He wanted to somehow uncover the kind of horrific um, kind of workplace he dealt with on a day-to-day -day basis here. And for him, he wanted to brought, provide not only a kind of visibility to these children, but also some kind of social concern for their plight here. Now, we might look at this and say, OK, factory workers on the right, factory workers on the left, factory workers on the right, inside their domain, factories on the left, workers on the left, within their domain. But once again, we too would probably say, this probably isn't a very good comparison either, right? Because I don't imagine that the photograph on the left was taken with the idea of revealing how horrific their working conditions were, right? They were brought out for what? To perform the job that other laborers wouldn't perform, or the labor unions weren't performing here. Okay. Here's the third of these here. Huh. Lined up against the wall. Hmm. I think we've heard that one before, too. <laughs> right? 
who gets lined up before the wall in some kind of, some kind of specimen-like fashion, you know, of course, police lineups like this happen here. I love this particular photograph. This is the Mount Holyoke College Art Museum collection. I remember when at first, this is a little bit of a side story, I remember when the curator called me down and said, we got these great new photographs, I want to show them to you. So I came down to the museum and looked at them. And I thought, yeah, these are wonderful photographs, but I'm not exactly sure what's being asked of the viewer, particularly in 1938. If this was a police lineup, how could you possibly mistake any of them for each other in this way, right? I mean, it seems to be the most absurd kind of police lineup you could possibly imagine here, right? Especially with the Chinese man in the middle of it. How could he possibly be mistaken for any of the other characters? But anyway, nonetheless, that's, not, that's kind of beside the point here. Let's just simply say that, you know, here is an effort at criminalization here and the ways in which the police find it was a way of trying to demarcate individuals as criminals versus those who were not. We would look at the photograph on the left and say, hmm, that doesn't seem to be right either, is it? You know, these men who have been brought across the Transcontinental Railroad and arrived in North Adams, Massachusetts, are not necessarily being thought of as criminals, particularly from the point of view of the factory owner. He thinks of them as somehow or other a new potential pool of laborers to somehow or other man the births that were otherwise left unmanned by those unruly labor union workers in North Adams here. So all of these possibilities, although as a photo historian one brings on to think about the photograph that we're under, under question here, are helpful, but only to a point. It seems to me that the best way to think about that particular photograph, this very famous photograph, first photograph of the Chinese east of Mississippi in this country, is to think of it as a kind of what? boosterist sort of thing, isn't it, right? Here's Calvin Sampson. He's gone to some great expense to bring these laborers into North Adams, Massachusetts. He's even cleared out some of his factory space to have bunks made available to them. And he says, in order to somehow or other celebrate my achievement, I'm going to have a photograph made of them. And not only am I going to have a photograph made of them for my album, I'm going to put it in a stereo view format, a popular format, and to have it distributed widely to show my ingenuity in overcoming the qualms of labor unions and to make good on the possibilities of the Transcontinental Railroad. In fact, we know he distributes this widely, and we can imagine other factory owners throughout all of New England looking at the claims that are being made of this photograph and thinking, aha, I've got some new ideas in my head. <laughs> I've got some new ways of thinking about how I can go about manning my own factories here. And I think Calvin Sampson is banking on such a thing here. So, once again, to go back to our original premise for this uh, lecture this evening, how do we use photographs to think about historical ideas and historical moments? Here's a photograph all about a factory owner's attitude and the ways in which this photograph can concretize or visualize or make vivid a factory owner's attitude. But I also said, you might remember when we talked about the original characters, there's enthusiasm on the one hand, and there's also anxiety on the other hand. And it's certainly the way in which photographs operate, because photographs are never singular meaning things. They often have multiple kinds of meanings. Because after all, it isn't just the factory owner and his photographer who are taking pictures of these men. The men themselves are standing in front of the wall there and having photographs of made. What ambitions can we ascribe to their attitudes behind this? Uh, we know a whole lot that, that these particular men in general were quite tickled by having their photograph taken. Most of them, in fact, had probably never seen a camera before. They arrive in North Adams, Massachusetts. They're told by their new factory owner boss to line up in front of the factory floor and their factory wall. They have their photograph taken. They look at the result and say, my god, what is this thing that I'm looking at here? Right? We know they're enthusiastic because they take their hard-earned money, about 90 cents a day, they save up they go to the same photographer who takes this photograph, and they say, we want photographs of ourselves. At the time, their photographs would have cost probably about a buck 20 to a buck 50 per session. So imagine more than a full day of hard work being put aside to have a photograph made of themselves. And boy, they go again and again and again. <laughs> For the entire time they are in North Adams. Now, we can imagine the letters they were getting from home. For those men who could read, mom and dad are saying, where's the money? <laughs> how, is it, how come the money isn't coming back across the Pacific Ocean? The family, 
I mean, we can imagine the sun writing in a very coded fashion. I just spent it on a photograph right in here. Okay, so let's flip the equation a little bit here. We've been talking a little bit about that famous photograph of men against the south wall as being somehow or other a concrete visual evidence of a factory owner's enthusiasm. But what did photography mean to these men here? Okay, so I need to take us a little bit to a side story here for a second uh, to talk a little bit about something that probably isn't so familiar to us today, but certainly was for these men in the 1860s and 1870s. You know, we are so comfortable with the camera today. You know, we all have them on our iPhones and Androids and all over the place. That you know, having a photograph or taking a selfie means nothing. Right? And we can take thousands of them, post them on Facebook, and do whatever we feel like doing with them. But try to imagine a time, if we can, to imagine a time when doing such a thing was not possible for the vast majority of the population. To have any kind of presentation made of yourself was reserved for those with means and money. And it wasn't a photograph they were making with this means and money. They were probably making paintings and portraits of themselves here. But in 1839, when photography is invented, initially in France and also in England, suddenly there is this new technology which puts the possibility of self-representation within the reach of millions of millions of people who had never previously had that ability before here. Uh, it is a kind of astonishing thing. And here is, once again, a caricature. This happens to be a French caricature done in Paris in the year 1839 near months after the daguerreotype, or the earliest camera, was unveiled as a new machine here. And the uh, caricature is called daguerreotype mania. <laughs> it's a crazy thing. Uh, it's a little hard to see where you are, so let me narrate what we're looking at here. Somehow, daguerreotype mania has brought out not just a couple of Parisians, but it seems like, you know, all Parisians into the road here. And they're descending in mass on the photographer's store. What do they all want? They all want to buy cameras, or they want photographs of themselves. And they're taking cameras, and they're hauling them away, and they're pulling them this way, and they're taking photographs of themselves, and this guy's stealing one, and he's kind of selling his daughter for one, and the photographs are going wild, and the camera is becoming a kind of craze. I was trying to imagine on the way here this afternoon, this evening, if there's anything today that would somehow produce this kind of craze. I cannot imagine anything like it. Maybe the new iPhone? I don't know. But anyway, here's a kind of crazy thing that at least this caricature imagines happening in the cultural landscape. Such is the craze, there's a kind of collective hallucination, right? Uh, in the background, the trains that are arriving across the horizon are not made up of little cars, but they're made up of little cameras. Okay. And the man who's flying in the balloon overhead, taking images below, is riding not in a basket, but in a camera. Right. Uh, and my favorite part of this entire caricature is this part up here. I don't know if you can see it well enough. Can you kind of see what's going on up there? Um, people have hung themselves because of the daguerreotype mania. And I can imagine, who would be hanging themselves because of the daguerreotype mania? Portrait painters, right? <laughs> because we're out of business in a certain life that's like this, right? If we can get back to this particular moment when suddenly this little tool that we are also familiar with today makes possible a kind of collective you know, enthusiasm for self-representation, we will get some sense of what these Chinese men felt in front of that south wall. Suddenly, here's this camera, a thing that we've never seen before, that can actually provide an image of me when no such thing had previously ever existed before, right? We only need to show, and once again, I'm taking a little bit of a side story here, something of those results. Pre-camera, post-camera, right? Pre-camera, as I said previously, is an aristocratic prerogative here. In this case, let's not worry about who these people are so much. It's by Thomas Gainsborough, Gainsborough, Mr. and Mrs. Andrews. We have no idea who Mr. and Mrs. Andrews are, but the painting tells us a whole lot about who they are, doesn't it? They're people with a lot of land. <laughs> uh, Mr. Andrews apparently likes hunting, hope he can shoot a gun, but the portrait painter makes it seem like he can shoot a gun. 
Mrs. Andrews, God knows that she's literate or illiterate, but in fact, the portrait painter has a book in her hand to suggest, aha, she's a woman of letters here. You know, and it's this kind of wonderful way in which portrait painters can fictionalize a sitter's status. Right? Uh, and all kinds of things are being told to us about Mr. and Mrs. Andrews because of the services of the portrait painter. As I say, it's an aristocratic prerogative. But suddenly in 1839, it's not just an aristocratic prerogative, isn't it? Everyone can take an image of themselves and provide some kind of visual evidence of who they are or who they would like to be. And I want to stress this last part because you know very well, and I know very well, that having a photograph of yourself and making a photograph of yourself, or as I watch my daughter put photographs of herself on Facebook, right? Most often those photographs have very little to do with fact, right? and a whole lot to do with fiction here. And in this case, fiction, right? And we would say, probably a certain level of fiction here as well, here, right? On the left is a photograph from a woman from Northampton, Massachusetts. We don't know her name, but we know a fair bit about her. Who is she? She's a factory laborer who worked in the nearby town of East Hampton, Massachusetts. She probably saved up a lot of money, took her hard-earned money, went to the big town, Northampton, Massachusetts, sat in front of the photographer's studio, and had a photograph made of herself. And there are many things she's telling us in this picture, right? Uh, she's not a factory laborer. She's a well-dressed lady. She brings in another photograph of, and we don't know who it is, a man of some sort. Could be a father, could be a brother, could be a loved one, could be simply a sex god. <laughs> and she's somehow saying, this is me, right? and I'm with this guy here. And we can imagine all those claims are now being made possible because of a photograph here. Suddenly, the possibility of self-representation seems to be endless in this sense here. Uh, we know it takes off like wildfire in this part of the world. Even Calvin Sampson himself has a photograph made of him. What does he want to show himself as? Not the shyster factory owner that he is, but in fact, quite a dignified man here, isn't he, in this case, with slick gray hair and a kind of you know, noble beard. And over on the left, you know, one of the more famous ones from the Civil War here, uh, African-American soldiers who joined the Massachusetts infantry and fought in the Civil War here. And to have a photograph of themselves in Union Army uh, 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 uniforms here is somehow a claim to a certain kind of identity, a certain kind of pride, a certain kind of sense of self that was otherwise unavailable here. So, when we look at these things from North Adams, Massachusetts, I would suggest that what we're looking at is something on par with what we've been seeing up till now. Suddenly, these Chinese laborers show up, they arrive in Massachusetts, they stand before the photographer against the south wall, and a little light bulb goes off in their head, and they say, wow, I can have photographs of myself. I can send these photographs to mom and dad, potential mate, right? I can send my photographs of this myself to potential competitors, potential employers, and all of these things are now made possible because of the services of the photographer here. Okay, let me kind of go return to our story here. We're back in North Adams, Massachusetts. The Chinese have arrived. Photography is somehow in the middle of all of this, and somehow mediating a lot of the relationships in this story of Massachusetts and the arrival of the Chinese across the Transcontinental Railroad. We know that that photograph wasn't just something that spurred the Chinese. In fact, all of those deposed laborers who the Chinese replaced in the factories saw that photograph, and they too went to the factory photo photographer and had photographs made of themselves here. Right? And we have here an example, right? Over on the left, a Chinese factory worker at Sampson's. Oh, from the right, sorry, on the left, one of the deposed Knights of St. Crispin's shoemakers from the factory here. And I'm really, really struck by the differences in these photographs. Now, I promised you earlier that there's going to be audience participation <laughs> in this year. And here's why I want to kind of turn it over to you here. For you, what are the differences between these two pictures? You know, and I'll, you know, I'll play devil's advocate for a second. Someone might come into our conversation and say, okay, Two shoemakers who both worked at Samson's. They both go to the photographer. They both sit for the photographer. Same thing. What do you think? Yeah, please. 
Well, on the right, the Chinese laborer is not working. He's sitting there quite regally like he's the patron or something. And on the left, that lady has his apron on, he's got he's sewing or whatever he's doing. It's a completely different presentation of self. I agree, absolutely, yeah. You know, and let's imagine this. He's gone to the photographer's studio. The photographer doesn't have shoemaking things as part of the props of the studio. So this man has brought his stuff with him. He's brought his apron with him. We can see it's probably the apron he's used a whole lot. It looks like it's pretty ragged and pretty worn around the neck there. He's brought his thread and his, his needle, and he's brought a shoe and a little hammer. And he sits down and he says, you know, now I'll take a photograph of me. You know, what's, a, what's kind of humorous, probably unintentionally so, is he does it against some kind of wild tropical <laughs> backdrop. But, you know, nonetheless, there it is. Uh, or as with the Chinese man, that same laborer, from the same moment in time, shows up at the same studio and says, okay, take a picture of me now. You know, uh, he decides, don't take a picture of me as a laborer. Take a picture of me as, now once again, I'll turn it over to you. What, how are you reading this particular photograph here? It's doing that all right. Doing well, right? Yeah. At 90 cents a day, <laughs> I am doing really well, Mom and Dad, right? Uh, uh, and looking at the shoes. Uh, yeah, to go, go with that a little bit more. Um, you have what looks like gold-plated shoes yeah. on uh, the Chinese man, and yeah. the other one, you know, it's, it's almost like the typical, the cobbler can't afford his own shoes. Yeah. You know, they're, they're, they're very shabby looking. They're shabby looking, yeah, and over on the right, would we think there's really gold in those shoes? <laughs> Probably not, right? What has he done to somehow achieve the effect of it looking like gold in his shoes? He's taken a little yellow ink, <laughs> and he's kind of painted in there, and he's painted the gold on his shoes, he's painted the buttons on his jacket, and if you look really closely, he's painted a little red pom-pom on the top of his head there, right? He's, what is he? He's accessorizing, right? I mean, it's kind of like, you know... Is he saying he's walking the streets of gold? Well, I mean, there's a kind of, uh, I agree, there's a, there's a kind of um, claim for luxury here, isn't there, right? Uh, uh, and this is a presentation of the self that we know full well is far removed from the actual conditions of his life here. He's a, quite a poor man, making not a whole lot of money, and whatever he's making is either going to the photographer's studio or going back home to mom and dad here. And yet, when he shows up in the studio, just as like my daughter does when she's on her Facebook page, there's a certain amount of fictionalization that happens. He shows up and says, this is how I want to present myself. I'm not a laborer. Least of all, I'm not a strike breaker. I'm not a scab. I'm not any of those things. I am a Chinese man with a certain amount of dignity and somehow having arrived at a place like this. And I want no part of any kind of identification with labor in this situation. Whereas over the left, here's a man who makes the exact opposite claim here. And I once again, I'll turn it over to you. And here's where we think art historically. We take a photograph like this and we think, well, how can we think back through to history based on this kind of visual evidence? Why make a claim like this? Here, you know, we're having to speculate a little bit, but why would you want to make a claim like this? Advertising. Advertising for yourself? Yeah, you know, I'm a laborer. I can do this sort of thing. Yeah, well, what else do we think here? Yeah. Well, if the shoe factories are taking over and he was a combo making shoes, he might want to show that there's something better about making your own shoes and having them handmade. Right. And being a factor. Right on. Because if the way what is he what is he showing us? He's showing us a handmade shoe. And we would say the kind of labor he's exhibiting ain't the kind of labor that's going on at the factory floor, where that bottom machine is pounding those things into the shoe. He's showing you a cobbler's craft. He's not just a factory laborer, he's an artisan. And he's a skilled artisan. And he says, at this particular moment in time, when my labor is simply being farmed out to immigrants, he would say, I'm going to show somehow or other the skill that is involved in precisely my craft here. Right? And he's willing to make that kind of claim when he shows up in the studio and says, this is my identity here. Yeah, uh, the other thing he's not showing in that photograph or the other photograph is the conditions they would have had to work on there. You've got to remember there was no air condition. Oh, sure. They probably had lousy water, deep in water, and, and it was correct to work under those conditions. Oh, sure, absolutely, yeah. These are not, you know, these are not, in fact, you know, pleasant 
OSHA places these days, right? They're, they're pretty tough places to work. And yet, you know, here he, is, he makes this claim. Now, once again, we should also say fiction. Probably a little bit of fiction there as well. Right? And there's probably some kind of myth-making going on in this case here. Yeah, yeah please. Uh, on the, the photograph on the right, the, the body language is so interesting. It's almost like contemporary boardroom kind mm -hmm. of, you know, cock of the walk kind of thing, you know, yeah. with a crossed leg. And yeah. I can't imagine that that was traditional no. body language where he came from. No. And on the right, you have, he's kind of closed in. It's, it's this humility that's kind of, yeah. that he's expressing. Right, he's, he's yeah. so concentrated on his yeah. task and the task at hand that somehow or other his whole body exceeds to that task yeah. at hand. You're right on. The right on the right does not in any way fit the profile of um, uh, traditional Chinese portraiture. Uh, you know, and once again, photography is not a thing that is available to him back in China. This is the thing he kind of discovers here. So the visual equivalents for him in thinking about self-presentation are those Mandarin kind of portraits, those kind of Qing um, portraits there. And those things are have a very different kind of bodily comportment, bodily presentation. I, I hesitate to show you what that looks like because I will make a fool of myself here. But, <laughs> but it is really a frontal sort of thing with your body yeah. spread wide because you have to show the girth of your body and all four limbs and the kind of frontality of presentation and the majesty of your presence here. And as you say, what is it? He's, he's relaxed, <laughs> he's urbane, and he's accessorized, right? <laughs> and it's, and it's a very different kind of sense of self here that's made possible now because of these things. You know, one wonders how mom and dad interpret this back home. Like, What's happening to my son? You know, he's going to a place like this here. Uh, yes, okay, so here are photographs that help us into what? The social relations between individuals at this moment in time, the conditions that labor brings about at this particular moment in time, and the fallout of the transcontinental railroad on individuals at this moment in time here. Um, right. I want to go back to this one here. I think you were all right on earlier. You just looked at this one and said, you know, here's, here's a kind of dandy in the making in a way. We don't know this man's name, uh, but we do know that of the many Chinese laborers who went back to the photographer studio, he was particularly avid. <laughs> he went back again and again and again. Now, either he had a lot of parents, right, or a lot of potential romantic partners, or lots of friends and all over the place, or maybe something about the photography studio itself was something that was kind of alluring and fun and playful. And we have so many different kinds of images of him that what we're looking at right here is not the only kind of presentation he decided to give of himself. Let me show you another one that he gave of himself. It's this one. <laughs> So here's, I'm going to turn it over to you once again. What do we make of this? Well, I mean, what, I mean, there are many ways in which we can make sense of this comparison here, and you know, let's, let's, you know, let's speculate a little bit. What do you think here? I mean, he's becoming Americanized. He's adopting a new culture. Okay. And, you know, making an effort to change himself so he becomes part of this new you know, this new way of life. Okay, yeah, yeah. If we can imagine this as, a, as evidence of Americanization, assimilation, maybe. I think that's possible, sure. Any other ways we can think about this here? Uh, Where would he have gotten those clothes? Yeah, that's a good question here. Did the clothes look like they're his? Uh, no, no. no. How do we know that? They don't fit. They don't fit. <laughs> they absolutely don't fit. Right, they look like they're like, you know, he's swimming in these clothes here. <laughs> And we would imagine, right on, someone said, they're probably at the photo studio. So he shows up, you know, and he says, oh, let me try that one on. And he tries it on. And if we understand that potential possibility here, what meanings can now we ascribe to that photograph? He shows up at the studio, he said, oh, wow, look at that thing. Let me try it on here. Uh, that's how it's, yeah, please. The pocket one. Yeah, the pocket watch. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Can I, can I have that pocket watch there? I'll, I'll tuck it in. We know it's not his, right? Yeah. Right on here. So. It was Halloween. It's, he, it's a costume, isn't it? And he says, I'll try this costume on and see what it feels like. And it may be a symbol of Americanization, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. You could just simply say, be him say, I'm going to try this on and see what it's like. 
you know, and how many of us have gone to, or have seen evidence of people who have gone to photographer studios and tried on, you know, cowboy outfits, or like, you know, crazy kinds of things here. And once again, it's kind of playfulness in this case. It doesn't say anything necessarily about him, it's a fictionalized thing as well. But it's a new possibility for an identity that he's simply, literally, trying on. And it's seeing what it feels like. It's not just this, he tries on all the other kinds of things. In fact, he almost looks in certain cases like he's a factory owner in this sense here, right? And we would say, wow, talk about delusional in this case, fictionalizing and delusional at the same time here. Uh, you know, let's return now to end our story. The guy who brings all of this about, in North Adams at least, is Calvin Sampson, right? He brings the factory or the, the laborers across the Transcontinental Railroad. He has that first photograph of them made, and unbeknownst to him, that first photograph spawns countless other kinds of photographs, which, for some reason, he's now responsible for. He doesn't particularly like what has happened. And so, about six or seven years after the Chinese arrive in North Adams, he takes them and gathers them all together again. By this point in time, more Chinese laborers have come across the Transcontinental Railroad. The factory's bursting at the seams with new laborers. They're filling up the bunks. He's having that factory, ironically enough, move machines out of the way so they can put more bunks in for the factory laborers to come and take up their places. And he says at a particular moment in time, enough is enough. All of you come outside. I'm going to have another photograph of you made. And this is the last photograph he makes the Chinese laborers, right? from the year 1875. So last audience participation here. What do you make of this one, especially compared to the very first one? Now someone might come into our conversation and say, okay, first one, a bunch of Chinese laborers in front of the factory. This one, a bunch of Chinese laborers in front of the factory. Same thing. I don't see any difference. Thank you. Like they might have had to give up their lunch break for this one. Yeah, they had to give up their lunch break. You know, they're, they're still in their work clothes. And he's willing to stop the factory machines, to pull them out of the factory and say to them, you're going to stand in front of this factory again. I'm willing to take a loss you know, on your productivity in order to have this photograph made. Uh, what else do you think about this one in comparison to the first one? Here for you, what's the difference in this? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it looks different to me. The other one, this factory is almost like a school. Yeah. So you would take, you know, you line up the kids in front of the school and you take their picture. Like yeah. That. I agree. So it's very important for him that the factory is not just a blank wall in the background. Yeah. It's being shown as a factory mm -hmm. here, right? Okay. Yeah. What else? What do you think? I think that's right on. Yeah. What else? What else for you is different between uh, the first one and this one here? Yeah, please. They're looking away from the factory. Yeah. Yeah, they're outside, they're lined up in front of the factory, they're not just there kind of, you know, in, in, uh, in some kind of school-like procession here, but they're literally flowing out from the factory and they belong to that factory, right? And they are being watched by some townspeople who kind of are witnessing a claim being made about them. And here's how I interpret this photograph, and there are many ways we can probably interpret it. But, you know, after all of this flurry of photographic activity, Calvin Sampson says, okay, I'm going to turn to the camera once again, and I'm going to make my claim once again, as a factory one. And what's the claim I'm making here? These are my workers. They're working in my factory. They're working on my dime during my day here, right? And all that energy that's going on in the photographer studio that the photographers take on themselves, when the shoemakers go out by themselves, where they spend their hard-earned money, and whatever kind of fictionalized identities they want to ascribe to themselves, here's who they really are, he seems to be saying in a situation like this. Once again, and I haven't brought in the original, the original once again is a stereo view. He wants to distribute it and wants to make another claim for who he thinks they are. Uh, what happens? The story has a kind of grim ending. Ten years after these men have arrived, uh, their contracts are up. And Calvin Sampson, having successfully broken the labor unions, the Knights of St. Crispin's, come crawling back to him for any kind of money they can get. He no longer leads the Chinese. He allows them to be dispersed. Uh, but their very presence has caused enough anxiety on the East Coast that in 1882, the US Congress takes up a bill and passes the infamous Chinese Exclusion Act. And in that year, it says, no more Chinese in the country. Because of, and I hope you can feel today, something of what these photographs have suggested about the trouble 
they've all caused in this situation. Okay, so thanks very much. I'm also happy to answer any kind of questions at this point. You've been great with the audience. Oh. They go. Um, we don't know for sure. There, there is a provision in their contract which says that Samson must provide their transportation back. He never seems to have done so. Uh, and in 1882, it was probably better if you were a Chinese man in this country to somehow disappear. Right? And many of them probably disappeared into Boston. Some of them probably disappeared into New York. Some of them probably dispersed into various places in all along the East Coast. I'm sorry? Did they find work, though? Some of them did, yeah. Uh, one of the more famous ones, uh, who was the foreman of this group, uh, became um, uh, a grocer uh, who opened up a shop and uh, for a while did pretty well, and then was run out of town and went back to California and raised a family there. Uh, the most famous of them was a man who had, in a very scandalous way, an affair with North Adams woman. Right? Uh, and uh, he ends up going with her to her Florida estate, where he becomes a kind of gardener. <laughs> and as a gardener, he develops certain kinds of things in her orchard. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, it's funny, she, she is, uh, her, her, her name was Fanny uh, Burlingame, who was a distant relative of Anson Burlingame, who was the diplomat who actually opens up relations with China. Well, did, um, well, if they wanted to marry, they would have time to do that. They probably would have been shunned, spurned by the local men. Yeah. So, did they send back home for women to go? Well, they couldn't after they could. They couldn't. Yeah, they really couldn't. So, it was very much a woman's call at the time, with not very much pleasantry attached to the description. They were called part of bachelor societies. Um, and bachelor societies were often thought of as young men run amok, <laughs> who, who, uh, who in their leisure time spent their money in gambling and prostitution. Um, that's not a fair description of who they were, but because as you're suggesting by a historical necessity they became single men living in a kind of isolated community. Many of them did in fact uh, marry um, uh, non-Chinese women, uh, including three of the North Africans. And we can imagine others who probably feel their way back to San Francisco. Did they interact very much with black people? Uh, not in North Adams. North Adams had a very, very small uh, black population. Um, and in fact, uh, um, the, the, the places where they most interacted were not in New England, but in fact, much further south. Uh, and there are also places that there's, for those uh, Chinese who arrived not as laborers, but who were the sons of more high-born individuals, came to colleges, universities here. That's where they had some kind of other kinds of relations, social relations. Please. So in, in his uh, factory, there were only Chinese workers. Yeah. Uh, But in 1868 and 69, they struck for, as you might imagine, better wages, better conditions, uh, and he threw them out. Uh, he brought some other laborers in from North Brookfield. Folks know where North Brookfield is? It's yeah. kind of in the central part of the state here. Yeah, he brought them in, only to find out that they were part of the Knights of St. Christmas. He throws them out, too. And so that's when he turns to the Chinese to bring them in. So, in fact, no labor union workers worked at his factory during that 10 year period from 1870 to 1880. He had women working there, in fact, and they were doing kind of the, the pretty horrific work there. Uh, 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 but the kind of factory uh, uh, machinery work was done by the Chinese. Uh, if I could give you, uh, if I could extend that answer a little bit, uh, the factory uh, labor union that had been deposed did not take it standing, you know, lying down there. Uh, we saw them go to the photographer studio to make some kinds of claims about who they are. But it wasn't just photographically where they were making their activism. They, in fact, um, gathered together and tried to open up their own factory. It was called a cooperative. Uh, and it wasn't just localized to our thoughts. There were many such cooperatives around all of New England here. Many different kinds of industries had cooperatives in them, made up of 
previously um, uh, uh, employed factory workers who were part of labor unions. Uh, the cooperative in North Adams lasted for two, three years, and they just couldn't make an ends meet. And they, and they ended up closing and also dispersing. Mm -hmm. Many of them were French Canadians, so they ended up going back across the border to, to French Canada to, to, to get that place. Uh, how about Chinese in the Civil War? Were there any uh, regiments or nothing? Not were, were they citizens? Well, did they become citizens that the, the Chinese workers? Um, that was a big question. You know, uh, one of the one of the provisions, as we know today, that if you're born in this country, you are a citizen of this country. Um, that was put to the test by the Chinese. And although they were excluded from the country officially in 1882, many of them who remained claimed citizenship based on that provision. And that, that, that proclamation gained further, if murky, power after the 1906 earthquake, when that earthquake destroyed many of the records in San Francisco. And there was no way of proving or disproving citizenship. And so many of the Chinese men claimed continually citizenship without having any kind of evidence to be able to be proposed against them. Uh, one of the more famous outcomes of that is that they would also say that I have, I have sons right? uh, who were citizens, right? Who, will, uh, who could be citizens because I'm a citizen. Uh, in fact, they had no sons; they had paper sons, right? and they would sell these paper sons to to other other, other uh, aspiring. Any other? Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.